we're in a truly unique time right now that I don't think anybody saw coming. And you guys are uniquely positioned in the space to perhaps look into the use of NFTs in the planetarium and things like that. Tell me a bit about your vision as to what role the Frost can play in this Miami movement. We really want to um, be at the forefront of that. We want to work with the technology experts here, um, those strategic thinkers, futurists that, that can see beyond what we can see, um, see the, the applications, the potential, and then start talking about that with the public. Welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida. My name is Sergio Tijera. I'm your host. And each and every week, we bring you someone who has been a game changer in their field and who's touched the lives of thousands to get their perspective on their journey, their mindset, their struggles and successes so that we can inspire you on your journey. So let's get started right now. Today's episode is about the Frost Museum of Science located here in beautiful Miami, Florida. And my guest today is none other than CEO of the Frost Science Museum, Mr. Frank Steslow. And this museum, if you haven't been here, is an absolute work of art, providing education in a beautiful location using state-of-the-art technology and hands-on activities. As you can see here, the planetarium is spectacular with some amazing, amazing technology. An aquarium that is second to none. Absolutely unbelievable. So enjoy this episode with Mr. Frank Steslow. And thank you so much for being a fan and subscriber to Game Changers Live, which is now a top 2% podcast globally. Enjoy the episode. Here we go. And welcome to Game Changers Live. You can catch us each and every week on your favorite podcast stations, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, LinkedIn, YouTube, you name it, wherever you love to listen to it. We always bring you amazing, amazing guests. And today, my guest today is Mr. Frank Steslow. He's the CEO of the Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science. Welcome, my friend, to Game Changers. Oh, thank you, Sergio. Great to be here. Yeah. So as president of the of the Frost Museum of Science, Frank has over 30 years experience as a scientist and executive manager in science based nonprofit organizations, including eight years as the museum's chief operating officer. And as COO, he was responsible for the overall operations for the museum in the areas of finance, communications, marketing, exhibits, environmental conservation, public programming and visitor services. Quite a handful. Before joining the Frost Science, Tesla was the CEO of Da Vinci Science Center in Allentown, Pennsylvania. He served in several executive leadership positions at the Florida Aquarium, the New Jersey Academy for Aquatic Sciences, where uh, for five years he, he was the Academy's COO. And before his career in the public aquaria, he worked as an environmental scientist for the state of Florida and as a biological scientist for the National Marine Fisheries Service in the Bering Sea. Must have been a little cold there. And so he also received a Master of Science degree in Environmental Health and Science from USF and also holds a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from Penn State University. So quite the, the lineup of experience there in the field, Frank. What, what was it that drove you to being so passionate about environmental sciences and, and, and water conservation in general? Yeah, you know, I um, growing up in South Florida in part, um, always was intrigued by the marine environment, uh, the coast. I became certified as a diver when I was 13 um, with a junior certification. And, wow. Uh, just was, you know, was always digging in the tide pools and the sand and uh, just intrigued by what was going on. And, um, you know, my parents moved back and forth between the Northeast and, and Florida. And so I kind of got a taste of a lot of different diverse habitats and, um, having opportunities to study different things and just kind of got really interested in the environment in general. Um, and so I studied microbiology as an undergrad, but it was, I kind of was leaning towards environmental microbiology. And then I had the opportunity to focus on that in graduate school. And it was really- so what's, the, what's the difference there between the microbiology and the environmental microbiology? Sure, well, microbiology is pretty diverse, right? So you have human, 
pathogens and, and microbiomes of the body and um, environmental microbiology. You also have industrial micro, micro which is really focusing on uh, fermentation, breweries, you know, all kinds of pharmaceuticals at the moment. But environmental is really about the the, the base of the ecosystem. What are the microbes right. doing? Um, what's a healthy ecosystem? What's not? What are the potential uh, disruptions, pathogens that, that can be in those systems? And I was really focusing on the marine environment, um, which brings in a lot of water chemistry work, water quality. So it's a pretty diverse training ground where you Sort of get well-rounded in a number of different aspects of science and, and i think a really good um training for what i'm doing now which is trying to interpret broad-based science for the general public that's one of the most interesting things in your role now right it, that you can bring the experience that you've had not only from the educational side you know uh studying this in in college and universities but also in interpreting it in a way that makes sense to people and it and it's valuable for people because it is a complex world and there's so much we you know we do understand there's so much we don't understand but getting it to the public in a way that's that's useful is a tough task that's what aquarium science museums do i mean that's um at the core of you know our mission is to really take those complex issues whether they be strictly in the ocean side ocean conservation ocean sciences marine science or general physics chemistry astronomy and um, make them accessible to the public. And so a lot of the team here are, um, you know, experts in uh, taking those topics and uh, sort of assimilating them into exhibit components and educational programs. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, since I've been in this field, you know, 25, 30 years, museums always rank at the top of the most trusted source of information for the general public. They, they always rank above academic institutions, uh, non-governmental agencies, governmental agencies. So we, we hold this sort of unique place um, where, at least for now, um, we're, still, we're still a trusted source. Of it's more people. trusted than Google. <laughs> really. <clears throat> so people do come to us. They come to us to have fun, but they come to learn and they come to mm. find information that they might not um, have access to otherwise and see some real world examples of that in the museum, both in terms of historical artifacts and living collections and mm -hmm. other kinds of uh, exhibit experiences. Right, bringing the past to life it is, is one of the most memorable things that a museum does, especially you know when people think of museums, they think of, of the dinosaurs and you know the big museums up in Washington and, and the fact that they can bring these experiences to life for, next, for newer generations that weren't obviously you know can't it's hard to relate to that even it's hard for my kids to relate to what it was before the computers so imagine you know it, back in the dinosaur era but it really brings things to life yeah i mean one of the more difficult concepts to um to sort of provide the visitors and have them understand well is the geological time scale um right i mean the time scale is so vast and when when you take a topic even like dinosaurs dinosaurs lived on the earth for hundreds of millions of years um and so you know we've we've been around for a blip of that in terms of humans mm -hmm. relatively two hundred thousand years um but it's just really hard to um to sort of get folks to understand especially you know younger kids what that that time scale is and then extrapolate that which is actually pretty small onto the time scale of the universe um you know right. seven billion years eight billion years um yeah. so it's just it's mind-boggling on, on some of these topics uh, when you start really looking into them and, and, and trying to get them across to people in a way that makes sense what what is the most effective way to wrap your mind around something like that because as we'll talk about a little bit later, there's some new technologies coming around that it's hard to wrap our minds around, is what has been the most effective means to, to you know, when we talk about time scales, right? Just thinking about the dinosaurs and where we are, where, from your experience, what has been the most effective way to, to show that? Um, you know, some of it is just um, illustration. So for example, distances. Um, just mm. in our own solar system, you can, and I've, I've done this, we don't, we don't have this currently here, but I've done this in other institutions where you 
put objects out in the field that are at uh, a scaled distance to um, to what our solar system is. So if you're standing here and you're the sun, um, you know, a hundred feet away is you know Mercury. Right, but right. Far away is Earth, and you know you you extrapolate that out, right. and, and you can sort of get the sense on a scaled basis, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of what that is. But, but you know, the the thing is, lots of scientists have a hard time getting their head wrapped around them. Yeah, and they, exactly. intellectually they they understand it. The math works. The theoretical modeling works. But when you start trying to think about it in practical terms, um, it's still, I think it's difficult for lots of people. I think we, we try to compartmentalize things in a box, right? That we can kind sure. of see and understand. <laughs> and sometimes it's difficult. So the, Miami has not, you know, if you look at Miami from the 80s, you know, up until the early 2000s, didn't have a past that was rich in <laughs> in art, in museums, in, in culture and things like that. And that has changed dramatically. So tell, tell me a bit about that. Yeah, it's exploded. I mean, truly with um, with us opening the, this new museum here almost five years ago and Perez Art Museum next door and lots of other facilities that have either opened or refreshed or moved. Um, I think the cultural landscape here in Miami-Dade County is richer than, um, and has the potential to be richer than a lots of other uh, cities of its size. Clearly, you know, large cities with, institutions that are hundreds of years old, um, we've got a ways to go before we can build up to those scales um, in terms of quantity and, and size of institutions. But I think given the, the, the sort of age of Miami and, and the renaissance of the cultural facilities, it's, um, it's, it's pretty robust for, for its, its size and age. And for those of you who haven't been out there, the, the Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science is not only uh, geographically a centerpiece, you know, in terms of where it's located, it's probably one of the most, you know, prime pieces of real estate in South Florida, and it's gorgeous right on the water, but it is architecturally, it is amazing. I mean, it is gorgeous. If you haven't seen uh, both the outside and, and especially the inside of the aquarium, what was that process like, you know, when, when you're kind of building this out? Sure, it was um, it was a great process to go through, and I've built a few facilities um, and been part of those processes. We worked with a um, architect. Um, it, it's a UK-based firm called uh, Grimshaw Associates, and uh, their New York office was the prime on the project. And just some very um, very thoughtful and um, different thought uh, thought processes going into sort of this building. So Grimshaw has a history of focusing on large public buildings that, that handle big volumes of people like train stations and other right. things, and also some very unique environmental projects. So they kind of brought these two things together. Um, and, you know, the thought was originally to create a, um, a campus-like environment, number one, um, not a black box with kind of things on the inside, a very stunning building architecturally make use of the place. Um, so great views of the water and um, the park and the downtown. And from an environmental standpoint to you know try to use engineering and science in the design of the building. So one of the things that we did quite extensively was a lot of modeling of wind flow and solar radiation. Mm -hmm. And um, the building, it's, we're four buildings in a complex, but the four buildings are oriented in such a way that they um, they actually do a great job of grabbing the, the southeast breeze and funneling it right through the central atrium of the museum, creating a nice um, cooling, even, you know, in July and August, while it's, you know, still hot, um, there's always some air movement going on. And I, and I think that worked pretty effectively. Um so that was one of the aspects we, we wanted the aquarium to focus on South Florida. And the aquarium is, it's more than just an aquarium and an entertainment piece. It's really the entry point into science for a lot of people. It's um, nobody feels threatened by fish. Um, maybe if there's some fish, <laughs> perhaps. Um, you know, for the most part, it's a topic that people are comfortable with. And so yeah. marine science and the aquarium allows you to 
bring people into science and expand their knowledge base and also talk about things like water chemistry and math and physics and how that pertains to waves and currents. Um, so it's a great tool um, that, that just, I think, makes us more accessible than a science museum without an aquarium. And you guys do a lot of outreach outside of those walls that a lot of people don't know about. We were just having a conversation offline and I was shocked to, to hear of all, all the amazing things you do, both not only in South Florida, but overseas as well. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we've been trying to, um, I mean, the, the organization for a long time is a history of uh, informal science educational research. So understanding how people learn, what's the best way to teach science. And um, we have a lot of programs that kind of were um, offshoots of, of some of that original research. So we we have a, a internationally distributed preschool science curriculum that was developed and tested here in Miami uh, through monies from the National Science Foundation, very robustly tested, studied for efficacy. And we rolled it out here. We trained um, Head Start and preschool teachers. Uh, we published this whole set of activities and, and curriculum, and we now sell it and distribute it uh, internationally. And it's not too early, you know, in, in preschool to, to start getting uh, young children to start thinking critically. Absolutely. And understanding the natural world around them and developing a curiosity. So that's one program. Um, we have other uh, programs where we work with disadvantaged, underserved populations here in Miami, um, which is a smaller group of, of individuals, but we are with them for three or four years, um, trying to get them to... Um, uh, uh, college readiness, and also to prepare and hopefully uh, be interested in careers in STEM. Um, STEM, you know, is, is so important to Miami right now with everything that's going on in the technology sector. Um, and to have more local talent developed uh, for the technology community is going to start with uh, activities such as the one that I just mentioned, other things that we do. Right. And getting people interested in in technology at an earlier age so that they can pursue those studies as they um, as they advance. Um, and also overseas, right? You have uh, some work that you do with some of the, the resorts. As we, well. We've been, we, we're doing work with Celebrity Cruise Lines, um, programming their uh, teen centers on board their ships, uh, doing conservation messaging for their Galapagos uh, sailings. And we have a partnership with Aminyara uh, Resort in the Turks and Caicos, and we run monthly camps uh, for their um, guests. So those camps are both marine science and astronomy based. And uh, all of that's great. It gets our brand a little more um, known and, and out there nationally, internationally, um, and gives our staff opportunities to work on more diverse um, topics with with lots of different people so it's it's worked well for everything now miami being at the center of this miami movement that we know and, and and are experiencing we're in a truly unique time right now that i don't think anybody saw coming and uh because of the mayor's tweet and so forth the influx of mm -hmm. investments and bitcoin you know conferences and so forth and you guys are uniquely positioned in the space obviously a, a, not only a beautiful space but a very practical and useful space to perhaps look into the use of NFTs in the planetarium and things like that. Tell me a bit about your vision as to what role the frost can play in this Miami movement. Sure, um, it's really exciting. You know, we, um, as you said, nobody could have seen this coming. We designed the, the museum um, well, probably starting about eight years ago, um, up through about six years ago. Technology was not at the front of our thoughts about what we should be interpreting and what we should be talking about. Yeah. We've got a great template here in terms of what we have in terms of infrastructure and we have the ability to do it, but we just didn't see that coming. But in the last two years, you know, we've been thinking long and hard about what role can we play? Uh, we, we should be the lead institution from a cultural standpoint in terms of working with the technology community and both um, hoping on the employment side in terms of getting, uh, as I said before, children and young adults interested in, in these types of careers and pursuing it in college. But then more importantly, um, having the general public understand all of, the, all of what's going on. You know, what is blockchain? How does that impact 
you and your life or my life um, from you know medical records to all kinds of things that we see coming down the pike. Um, and then there's obviously the, the, the sort of interesting and fun side of things with gaming and uh, NFTs and collectibles, um, but tying it all together in a way that I think cohesively makes sense for the general public. And nobody in the science center community, science museum community has really uh, tackled that yet with exhibits or programs. And so we really want to uh, be at the forefront of that. We want to work with the technology experts here, um, those strategic thinkers, futurists that, that can see beyond what we can see, um, see the, the applications, the potential, and then start talking about that with the public um, and, and help build that excitement. You know, it's just, it's, um, it's one of those things we were just talking, you know, about the universe and time scales and trying yeah. to get your feet wrapped around some of that. But this is equally as complicated. You know, blockchain, um, while it's simple in concept, is complicated in delivery and understanding why it's secure, how it's secure, um, and how that might play a part in, in so much of what we do. And then there's the metaverse and like everything around around yeah. that. Um, and I remember um, back when email first came out and I was watching the Today Show and I remember Katie Couric being on there and, and asking the person, okay, and I remember her saying, okay, what is the internet? And yeah. And what are we going to use this thing called email for? And now we look back, we're like, how do we not see this coming? Sure. I think we're at a very similar point with with blockchain and, and cryptocurrency and everything else. Like that. And as we're trying to wrap our heads around it, you got to be open to new ideas because we tend to base our opinions and our version of reality based on the past, right? On our experiences of what has been and not what can be. And it's hard to kind of bring down those barriers sometimes. So I think... You know, number one, you're on the right path in terms of bringing this educational component to the frost because it's probably, the, you know, the most uh, central and, and most responsible place to, to do it um, because people need to understand their role in it and, and how it's going to impact because it already is impacting their lives. Yeah, and, you know, the challenge that, that we have, museums are trying to become more entrepreneurial and fast paced and responsive. Um, but the process of developing and testing exhibitions, um, while you can accelerate certain things, is a, does take time. It's not, it's not sort of as rapid as prototyping, uh, you know, um, sure. a piece of hardware or something. Um, because you're really trying to, to, you're not just building an exhibit, you're building a learning environment. And you have to understand if that environment is working correctly and if it's going to achieve the goals that you set out. Or is it just going to confuse people more? So there's a lot of testing <laughs> and evaluation that goes yeah. into it. But that that process doesn't work well with technology because technology is changing so fast. By the time you start developing an exhibition and put it out, say, a year and a half later, yeah, things have changed. And so I think we, ha we have to remake ourselves in, in the cultural sector, at least in the science community. Mm -hmm. Um, to rethink how we can do that. And, and I think in some ways, formal education is the same way, you know, to, to get new courses developed at universities, to uh, bring curriculum into high school classrooms. All of that is a lengthy process. There's politics involved. There's, um, there's just developing and testing and, and research. And we're just, the, the pace of innovation is happening so fast. Um, how does the educational community, the informal, the formal educational community, the, the museum community, keep up with that and, and be able to deliver products quickly um, and scale them quickly? Um, so I think we need to take cues from, from the corporate environment of how they do it. Obviously, resources are a little bit different and at an Apple or a Google or a Facebook mm -hmm. that we have access to. But some of the same tools um, we've got to find and make, you know, make available and train our staff and um, come up with some of those kind of rapid development, uh, rapid evaluation kinds of, um, you know, opportunities. Yeah, it's, so it's disrupting every, every industry from, <laughs> from museums on, on down the line. NFTs are, are a very interesting technology because when we think about ownership, 
let's say you talk about ownership of your of your home. You have a deed, and that deed says that you own this house. And what do we do? We put a fence around it. We lock the doors. We make sure nobody comes in. Versus if you own a digital asset, you want it to be shared. You want as many copies of it to be put, you know, put on other people's computers. And it's hard to think about, okay, well, why would I want that? But in the digital realm, the more it gets out there, the more popular it becomes, the more people want it, the more value it attains. And so it's, we have to kind of shift the way we think, right? In terms of this, this digital ownership and, and asset. And you guys have an amazing space in the planetarium, for example, whereby you know, there is this possibility of having this kind of augmented reality or immersive experience with NFTs. And that doesn't exist in, in today's world. Not yet, at least. <clears throat> yeah, that's one of the ideas we're working on, um, you know, to try to take the planetarium, which is our most technologically advanced space. Um, so it's a you know, half dome, 8K resolution theater, five projectors, 18 servers running all these crazy processors, uh, 3D capable. And how do you take that technology and um, blend it with the NFT um, crowd and be able to display NFTs, work around programs with NFTs, develop special NFTs that are just specific to that kind of technology um, where you'd have to actually be in an immersive space like that to truly appreciate them. Um, so the, that's that's certainly on the horizon. We also uh, the the building was designed to project on the outside of the dome of the planetarium. Mm. That's why it's a white concrete matte finished surface, and we have infrastructure in place to be able to do that. We just didn't have the funding originally to procure the actual projectors and servers and technology uh, to project onto the outside of the dome. Um, but that's an opportunity that would be in full public view in the evenings, um, should we be able to uh, to fund that. The, the, the interesting thing, though, is in the five years since we've been open, the technology on LEDs has changed. And now there are LEDs that are able to be put outside, high resolution. You could cover the entire surface of the dome with LEDs rather than project on it. Mm. You can choose the resolution and depending on how closely the, the pixels are together right. and individual led elements and you can create some really spectacular um, things now that you couldn't do before now that's still pricier than projection but it's an exciting wow um, way of thinking about it because it, it with the projection you're limited by where the projectors can be mounted and throw and you're sure. not really a full uh, coverage of a, of a sphere whereas this would completely cover the sphere um, brighter, so easier, more visible in daylight and dusk. Um, and there's a massive project going in in Las Vegas, uh, which is a um, several thousand seat venue. That is a dome and the outside of the dome and the inside of the dome are all LEDs. Wow. It's going to be opening, I think, in the next uh, 12 months. But that's the sort of the, the big proof of concept about what's what's possible. And you guys just recently purchased at Art Basel your first NFT. Is that right? Of a, of a dinosaur? We, we, actually, we didn't get it at Basel. Um, it was actually donated to us uh, oh, by the artist who's uh, working with um, one of the, um, I'd say, more active paleontologists in the field working um, on some dinosaur digs. And... Uh, they they collaborated and produced these 10 NFTs and donated them to 10 different museums. Um, so we have one of them. Um, they're all different. Uh, they're in a series. And um, we're excited to have it. I haven't figured out exactly what we're doing with it yet. To have ownership of it. And and dinosaurs, by the way, are is another content area that we want to move into. Mm -hmm. um, we're working hard to try to secure some specimens. So um, bringing, you know, permanent dinosaur collection to Miami is another thing at the top of the list. Well, you guys are doing some amazing things there in that space. And, you know, for those of you out there listening, I think one of the best ways to learn is by doing. And right now you can go out and, you know, purchase your, your own NFT and just start getting involved. 
that's probably the best way to, to start learning about it and, and seeing how it's going to impact your life. And make sure to go out to the to the Frost Museum. Uh, like I said, if you haven't been there, it is unbelievably beautiful. And it's just a state of the art facility, work of art as well that you can take your family and your friends to and have a great time there uh, with a beautiful view. And go say hi to Frank. He'll be there. He's there 24 hours a day. So no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, he does work hard. That is a facility that's practically it's open 24 hours a day in a sense, not to the public, but it's operational. Absolutely. Yeah. Because of the aquarium, um, we have staff here around the clock. We are open to the public 365 days a year. Um, so we're open Thanksgiving. We're open Christmas. Um, our hours change with the seasons to try to accommodate more, more guests when we have more opportunity. So this coming up this, um, this Christmas season, we'll have extended hours going into the evenings. Um, and right now we have uh, two special exhibitions. One is a smaller exhibition we just opened on uh, woolly mammoth, where we have a large sub-adult mammoth skeleton on display and some information about the ice age and the time of the mammoths. Uh, we also have a major traveling exhibition um, on skin, which goes through sort of the biology of skin and fur and animals and humans, um, and a little bit about um, skin from a social science standpoint with skin color and diversity and, and other things. So it's it's a pretty timely exhibition and that'll be here through April. And then we have a blockbuster exhibit coming for the summer called Sherlock Holmes, um, which is a crime scene investigation type exhibit, but it's putting you back in the time of uh, Sherlock Holmes. So we're, we're excited to have that cut this, this coming summer. That's going to be fun. Frank, CEO of the Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science. Definitely check them out. You can go to frostscience.org. Uh, and be sure to visit. Thank you, my friend. You guys are doing some amazing stuff. Thank you, Sergio. Very much appreciate it. If you loved what you heard in today's episode of Game Changers, please subscribe and rate us. The lessons and the stories in these podcasts are immensely valuable, so I invite you to share them with a friend who needs to hear it. You may end up being the game changer in their lives.